All right, uh, let's get into the Word. I want to begin by uh, just saying to you who are visiting with us tonight uh, that we're absolutely delighted that you're here uh, with us. We're glad to have you, and as always, trust that you'll be blessed because you came. Uh, also, for those of you who are regulars on Thursday nights, I just want to say to you that I sincerely appreciate your love for God's Word and that you would come out on a Thursday night and study through the book of numbers. <laughs> I mean, you got to love the Word of God, you know? So I just want to say thank you for your love for the Word of God. Tonight, Lord willing, we're going to complete chapter 31. We're making our way through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and uh, it's going rather slowly, but we are making our way through. Actually, surprisingly, we're almost done with the book of Numbers. Uh, there's only five more chapters after tonight, so uh, then we'll get into the fifth and final book of the Pentateuch, uh, the first five books of Moses, so the book of Deuteronomy, uh, which we will maybe go through quicker uh, since it is a uh, deuce law, do Deuteronomy twice. It's a repeating of, for a second time, the law. So there'll be a lot of uh, repetitive and uh, uh, so forth in the book of Deuteronomy. So uh, let's go ahead, if you haven't already, and turn there. We're going to pick it up in verse 8 tonight and make it all the way through to the end of the chapter. It's actually kind of a long chapter. But um, last week we only made it to verse 7. And I realize now in retrospect that uh, it was really the Lord that we didn't really finish the chapter because we dealt with a uh, part in the text that was uh, related to the battles that we experience in life and also the importance of spiritual warfare in this life. Now, we had in verses 1 through 7 uh, read and studied about how that Moses was given his last assignment and it was to take God's revenge and go to war against the Midianites for what they had done to the Israelites. We'll talk more about that here in a moment. But the first seven verses were really packed full of life lessons by way of application because it's really a much needed reminder of how it is that heaven's path is paved with battles. I'm reminded of in the book of Acts where we're told that the way to heaven is paved with much tribulation. We enter to, uh, into heaven vis-a-vis -vis many uh, trials and I don't want to necessarily be the bearer of bad news, but I'm of the ilk, if I can say it that way, that it's going to get increasingly more difficult for us as Christians in this day in which we live, in these last days in which we live, as it becomes increasingly more unpopular uh, to live in this world as Christians uh, with what is happening as the world waxes worse and worse. Also, uh, as it relates to the need to make warfare, to battle in the spiritual realm with spiritual weaponry, not carnal in nature. And so we studied uh, about the armor in Ephesians 6. If you weren't with us last week, I encourage you to get the CD and uh, you can sort of um, uh, catch up and uh, stay up with where we're at. I want to uh, quote A.W. Tozer in his writing, That Incredible Christian. He says, The Christian is a holy rebel, loose in the world, with access to the throne of God. Satan never knows from what direction the danger will come. See, I think that as Christians, we uh, do err when we cower and falter in fear of the enemy when we find ourselves in spiritual warfare. 
I think that we need to be reminded that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. You know, listen, the, the truth of the matter is, is that the enemy fears us more than we should ever fear him. We have been given not a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Well, there's one more thing I want us to uh, look at and actually kind of tuck in our hip pocket before we move on and jump in in verse 8, because it's really going to be germane to our understanding as we see how the rest of this chapter unfolds. Uh, this is a spiritual battle. This is a spiritual battle because vis-a-vis -vis Balaam, Medianite women seduced the Israelite men to sin sexually with them, and thus they brought upon themselves the curse of God, the judgment of God, the discipline of God, and it was against God in the spiritual realm. And again, in verses 1 through 7, we saw how that instead of uh, sending Joshua, the military leader, to go into battle, to wage war against the Medianites, to take God's revenge, and by the way, we talked about revenge as well, uh, they sent instead Phinehas, who was the uh, son of Eliezer, who was one of Aaron's sons, the high priest, and he took holy articles with him into battle. Again, the thing I want us to see here and keep in our hip pocket here is that this was a spiritual battle. They're battling in the spiritual realm. And this is key because we as Christians will find ourselves trying to fight a spiritual battle in the energy of the flesh. And all we do, like Peter, is make a bloody mess by cutting off Malchus's ear with our sword, our physical weaponry, our carnal weaponry. And when we do that, we will always lose. And actually, that's one of the tactics and the devices of the devil. He will always want to get us out of the arena of the spiritual and into the arena of the physical because he knows if he can do that, he's got us. There's no chance. We don't stand a chance. Now... The reason I'm taking the time to lay this foundation is because absent this understanding, there's going to be a huge misunderstanding. So let me explain. We're, we're about to read some pretty graphic details in this God's vengeance against the Medianites, and we need to have the why behind the what of what we're about to see happen in the rest of this chapter because it's going to get gnarly. And if we don't understand the why behind the what, the reason why we see this war being waged, this vengeance being taken, then we will misunderstand the character and the nature of who God is. So let's go to the throne, ask God's blessing in prayer, and we'll jump into verse 8. Lord, thank you for your word. Will you now, by your Holy Spirit, speak in that still and small voice that we might hear with our ears to hear, our hearts to receive, our eyes to see? Lord, we want our time tonight in your word to be profitable and fruitful. So we commit this time to you and thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. All right, verse 8. They killed the kings of Median with the rest of those who were killed. Evi, Rechem, Zur, Hur, and Rebba, the five kings of Median. Balaam, the son of Beor, they also killed with the sword, and the children of Israel took the women of Median captive with their little ones and took as spoil all their cattle, all their flocks, and all their goods. They, verse 10, also burned with fire all the cities where they dwelt and all their forts, 
and they took all the spoil and all the booty of man and beast. Uh, interesting. Did you notice that uh, we're told that Balaam died in this battle, in this war, that they were sent in taking the vengeance of God against them? This is the end of those who would try to curse Israel. And I would suggest, in taking it a step further, that on the authority of God's word in Genesis chapter 12, verses 2 and 3, that this will be the end of those who today wish to bring a curse upon Israel. You know, whenever I you know, see and watch the news and see what's happening, especially today as I was preparing for Sunday's prophecy update, which I just got lost in the update and lost track of time and realized that I've got a Bible study in the book of Numbers tonight and I better <laughs> get busy. And so, but it was so interesting to me and I, I found myself just kind of, you know, getting all this, all this emotion was starting to well up inside of me and I'm like, I'm getting angry and I'm hearing all of this, you know, that they're saying about destroying Israel and, and, and God just had to stop me and say, hey! JD, calm down. <laughs> Peace be unto you. You know how it ends. They're not going to succeed. If they're going to touch the apple of my eye, and I will destroy them in the end. And this is what we see with Balaam. This is the end. Now, think about this. This is... Maybe you don't think like this, and maybe that's a good thing. Maybe they have, you know, clinical terms for this way of thinking. But I know that he got paid big bucks by Balak to finally, ultimately get a curse. He didn't care how he did it. He just cared that he did it, and he paid him a lot of money. Now, I'm doing the math here, and I'm thinking that he didn't have a lot of time to enjoy that money. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world, gets paid big money, and yet loses his own soul? Something else I want us to see as it relates to the death of Balaam. Do you remember in chapter 23, verse 10, what he said when he was trying to curse the Israelites, and instead all he could do was bless them? And by the way, Remember the reason why he could not curse them when Balak took him to the high place to look down upon them? Because the camp of the Israelites was in the shape of a cross with the tabernacle in the center. And Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation, no curse, no guilt to them that are in Christ Jesus. And that's why he could not curse them. In fact, it was one of those, if you can't beat them, join them kind of things. This is, listen to what he said, Numbers 23, 10. Who can count the dust of Jacob or number the fourth part of Israel? Now watch what he asks. Let me die the death of the righteous and may my end be like theirs. <laughs> ain't going to happen. In fact, if you don't live the life of a righteous, Balaam, you will not die the death of the righteous. Let me say that in a different way. He did not live his life right with God, thus he didn't die at the end of his life right with God. You know, whenever I do memorial services, and probably the most difficult ones that I do, as you might imagine, are the ones that uh, are for someone of whom I am not certain uh, knew Jesus Christ. And it's really difficult, especially when family members will say, well, he's in a better place. I cringe and I die a thousand deaths because not necessarily, not necessarily. Was he right with God? Was he born again of the Spirit of God? 
Jesus said in John 3 that unless a man is born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. We talked about this on Sunday when Jesus says in the parable in Matthew 25 to the five brides who did not have oil in their lamp, he says, I never knew you. And that word for knew is the same word that the angel heard Mary say when he said, you're with child. And she said, I never knew a man. I never had that experiential knowledge, ginosko in the Greek, with a man. Unless a man has been born again, he will not see the kingdom of heaven. And it's for that reason that I don't think we'll see this balam in heaven. <laughs> see, in this walk we call our faith in Jesus Christ, there has to be a steadfastness in our rightness with the Lord in how we live our lives for the Lord. You know, Paul likens it to a race that we keep on running, and it's a marathon. It's a lifelong race. It's a lifelong walk with Jesus Christ in this walk of faith. Verse 12, then they brought the captives, the booty and the spoil to Moses, to Eleazar the priest, and to the congregation of the children of Israel, to the camp in the plains of Moab by the Jordan across from Jericho. And Moses, Eleazar the priest, and all the leaders of the congregation went to meet them outside the camp. But Moses was angry with the officers of the army, with the captains over thousands and captains over hundreds, who had come from the battle. And Moses said to them, Have you kept all the women alive? Look, these women caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to trespass against the Lord in the incident of Peor, and there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. I mean, amazing. <laughs> I mean, the very women who caused the problem at the start had been brought back to the Israelite camp in the end. And now, in all fairness to these 12,000 men, 1,000 from each tribe who did this, they spared and kept the women and children as sort of was the custom to do because women never would pose any military threat. Now, that's not to excuse it. Rather, it's to explain it. I would suggest that they did the right thing in the wrong way. Or they maybe did the wrong thing in the right way. Is that? Is that never mind. That's, <laughs> I'll let you sort that one out. But isn't that true for me and you? We do the right thing, but in the wrong way. We go about it the wrong way. Or how about this? We say the right thing in the wrong way, with the wrong heart. Thus, it's not received in the way that it was intended to be. Verse 17, now, therefore, kill every male among the little ones and kill every woman who has known a man intimately. Boom. Wow. This verse and verses like it are what give God so much bad press in portraying him as a God of wrath. Now, let me parenthetically say that on Sunday, as we uh, begin a new series and uh, work our way through the completion of Romans chapter 1, we are going to be dealing with this very specifically. We're going to, Lord willing, attempt to, in this new series, deal with questions like this. If, a God, if God is so loving, why does he allow suffering in the world? If God is so loving, why does he send people to hell? Or how about this one? I'm sure you've heard this one. How can, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Or why is God such a God of wrath? And you've probably heard a variety of different forms of that 
question, all of which have at the core of them this garden questioning of the goodness and the justice and the fairness of God. It's the same old lie or confusion, if you will, or question, if you prefer, that was asked in the garden by the serpent to Eve. See, he succeeded in questioning the nature of God and in so doing, deceived Eve into believing that God could not be trusted, that God was holding out, that God was unjust, unfair, unrighteous. See, this is the, it's an old lie with new clothes. It's an old lie with wrapping paper that's got uh, new wrapping paper on it. In other words, this is the lie of the ages. And so whenever you're asked, and I'm sure you're asked by people, especially when they bring up passages in the Old Testament where God commands like he is here, that everybody be, you know, killed. The women who had had uh, sex with men, the, uh, even we'll see the uh, little, uh, the, actually even the children. How about when uh, the uh, Israelites were to cut off all of the Amalekites and King Saul left some alive. Now, it's a difficulty, and I know if you're like me, uh, you've had difficulty trying to answer those questions. So on Sunday, Lord willing, we're going to, after our prophecy update, uh, deal with the wrath of God. In fact, I've titled the series, I'm going to, for the benefit of those, you'll, you'll for, on Sunday morning, you'll be able to tell, I already know what the title is. <laughs> Don't tell them. Let, them, let them wait. But the title of the series is going to be, Why God is Right to Damn Wrong. Yeah, pretty catchy title, huh? <laughs> That's what I'm talking about, yeah? No, think about that. Think about that. Well, we have such a passage in front of us, and maybe you'll just indulge me for a, a moment. I'll try to fill in at least a couple of blanks as it relates to what God's doing here and commanding the Israelites to kill these Medeanites. See, God in his grace is showing mercy on these Medeanites. How so? You're telling me that this is God's mercy, this is God's grace, having the Israelites kill these Medeanites? Yes. See, their fate is already sealed. They're already doomed. Okay? Uh, God, in a sense is putting them out of their misery and lessening their judgment because we're all recompensed according to that which we've done. Now, I know that might be a little intense, but it's the fact of the matter. And also in concert with the grace and mercy of putting them out of their misery like we would with an animal, a, a dog, who has rabies or some, you know, incurable disease, we will put them down, as it were. Why? Their fate has already been sealed. And in effect, we're putting them out of their misery. When you understand it in that way, it takes the edge off of it. And when you also understand that, that God is protecting the Israelites his children from what could and probably would happen absent the removing and the eliminating of these Medeanite women. Uh, let's move on, verse uh, 18, because I want to uh, kind of, this ties in, verse 18 says, but keep alive for yourselves all the young girls who have not known a man intimately. In other words, their fate 
has not been sealed. And also, it's important to understand, in the Middle Eastern culture, even to this day, the women, the girls, grow up to be women, but in the culture, they don't avenge the death of their fathers as would the Medeanite men, because that was the Medeanite way. See, in the Arab culture, I would avenge anything that was done to my sister uh, and or if any dishonor was brought to my family or any harm, it is my responsibility to honor the family name to avenge uh, whatever was brought uh, on us. Now, that's not the case with girls, so they would not pose later on a military threat. Now, this is interesting, and again, I, I want to just kind of try to fill in a couple of blanks. God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy, and he is sparing their lives in that grace and in that mercy. Now, understand that it's possible that some of these women who seduced the Israelite men were amongst those whom they brought back to the camp and then were subsequently ordered to kill. Now, there's a powerful lesson here, and I, you'll forgive me if this is strong, but I'm going to connect the dots with the sin of sexual immorality, internet pornography. See, if you don't get rid of it, it will get rid of you. If you don't kill the Amalekite, the Medeanite, that Medeanite, that Amalekite will kill you. As harsh as it seems, it's for your protection. You know, it's, it's really becoming, I, I got an email uh, from uh, some pastors on the mainland, Calvary Chapel pastors. I'm on this uh, email list server, and uh, one of them shared some recent statistics on internet pornography. And it just absolutely floored me. I couldn't believe my eyes. I mean, the statistics are just staggering. And they're increasing, I mean, every day. Every, the pornography websites that are added to the Internet every day are in the thousands. It's unbelievable. The, the search, the number one search when you, you, know, you search something on, on Google, it's a search for pornography. The number one. The revenue from pornography alone supersedes that of Google and uh, Facebook and uh, all of these, you know, major uh, Microsoft combined. Even the sporting events, NFL, the NBA, all of the sporting events combined annually don't make in revenue what the porn industry makes in revenue. Uh, you know, I'm going to make a statement. I, again, I know it's going to be strong, but uh, you know, I predicted this about three years ago when I was speaking at a conference, and I, I made this statement that I believe that it will be Internet pornography that will destroy from inside the church. It's that seduction of that Medeanite woman, the doctrine of Balaam, who seduces the Israelite man and then brings upon him the curse, the wrath, the judgment, the discipline, the chastisement of God. And this is how it ends. And so what God is saying to the Israelites is what he's saying to us today. Get rid of them. Deal with them harshly. Mortify the deeds of the flesh. Get rid of the Medeanite woman. 
You fill in the blank, whatever it is. And by the way, ladies, can I talk to you for just a moment? It's really interesting how that pornographers will suck you in using the chat rooms. You see, men and women are very differently wired, obviously, <laughs> which is a question I'm going to ask God about when I get to heaven. Why did you? What were you? Is there? Anyway, that's, no, I'm not. <laughs> the first jillion years I'm going to be going, Get a kick out of somebody saying, you know, I'm going to ask, I got a few questions I'm going to ask God. No, you're not. <laughs> you're going to be bowing before the throne. Holy, holy, holy. <laughs> but see, the way the woman is wired is she's emotional and relational. So, uh, and Facebook, by the way, is now beginning to uh, pick up where the chat rooms of old left off. So you've got the woman at home, and all of a sudden she starts chatting with or makes a Facebook friend with another man who says to her things like, you don't deserve that, and makes her feel like she's the most important person in the world, and her husband has never made her feel like that in many years. And just by virtue of the fact that, you know, he's giving her that attention, the three A's, without which no woman will survive and no marriage will survive. Attention, affection, and affirmation. You withhold any one of those three, and you, just, you can start the clock. It's just a matter of time. And that's why now the statistics when it comes to uh, internet adultery and the divorce that ensues, it's, it's increasing to such a high percentage, you know, of women leaving their husbands, leaving their kids to go meet this man that made them feel so special on the internet. And then the man, you know, they've proven that your brain will actually change by viewing more sexually explicit material. It actually changes the uh, way that you think. And, so, and it also affects the way you view women, obviously. I mean, that would seem like a firm grasp of the obvious, right? But all of a sudden now, you only see women in a sexual way. One of the things that I'm really working with my boys on is the uh, need to pray for their soul, not pray on their body. P-R-A-Y for the soul, don't pray, P-R-E-Y on the body and lust in your heart. You know, it's getting increasingly difficult to watch uh, just even, you know, Fox News because those commercials that come on or sometimes they'll have a preview for an upcoming, you know, program and it's spring break coming up, right? So is it safe to go to Mexico for spring break? Now why in the world do they have to show those women for this upcoming report? Aren't there other ways to, you know, have a report on spring break. But I mean, my goodness, I mean, I was so embarrassed. And I'm looking at my boys and, and you know, <laughs> yeah, and I'm thinking, okay, guys, I'm kept changing the channel. Okay, yeah. You know, then I, I go to the next channel and then it's worse. It's like, oh, so I have to turn it off. Okay, let's pray. <laughs> we need to repent. And then it's, of course, an opportunity to talk about lust and lusting by looking. Anyway. <laughs> but this is the why behind the what. This is why they're to take such drastic measures and kill these Medeanite women because if they don't, these Medeanite women will be the source of their ultimate destruction. Absent their doing this, it would have been to their peril. And so too for me and you, absent the removing of, the cutting off, the eliminating of those things that would represent 
the seductive Medeanite woman, it will ultimately be to our own peril and lead to our ultimate destruction. Verse 19, and as for you, remain outside the camp seven days. Whoever has killed any person and whoever has touched any slain, purify yourselves and your captives on the third day and on the seventh day. Purify every garment, everything made of leather, everything woven of goat's hair, and everything made of wood. Okay, what's God wanting to accomplish here? Well, I believe that he wants to deal with the cleansing of those who had carried out this God's vengeance. And he wants to purify both them and their garments. Now, I see this as a being both practical in the physical sense and symbolic in the spiritual sense in that this is God's way of cleansing both. Now, verse 23, uh, pardon me, 21, Then Eleazar the priest said to the men of war who had gone to battle, This is the ordinance of the law which the Lord commanded Moses. Only the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the tin, and the lead, everything that can endure the fire, you shall put through the fire, and it shall be clean." And it shall be purified with the water of purification. But all that cannot endure fire you shall put through water. And you shall wash your clothes on the seventh day and be clean. And afterward you may come into the camp. Uh, interesting. And again, full of meaningful information as it relates to us by application in our Christian lives. Here's what I'm thinking. Notice that they had to put all the precious metals through the fire to be cleaned and the water to be purified. This is how it is for us, is it not? Our faith likened unto gold as precious gold goes through the fire to remove the dross and were washed by the water of the word of God. I think of Isaiah chapter 48, verse 10, where he says, Behold, I have refined you, but not as silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. I don't like this verse. If I could just be candid with you, I don't want to be refined in the furnace of affliction. I would like to be refined in the lap of luxury <laughs> and ease and comfort but there's a problem. You don't get refined. <laughs> you don't get cleansed. You don't get purified in the lap of luxury, ease, and comfort. It's only in the furnace of affliction. Because see, what happens is, like the goldsmith, like our faith, as we'll see here in a moment, we are put through that fire and all the gook that is in us. And yes, there is gook in us. It's all burned to the top. And then the goldsmith, he scrapes off the impurities to make pure gold and make that pure gold more valuable, see? And here's what's really interesting. The goldsmith knows it's pure when he can see his image reflected in the fire. How cool is that? You know, whenever I do weddings, I love to, whenever they, you know, give me the rings and before we do the ring ceremony, and I, you know, just offer a little commentary on, you know, the gold and how it is that, you know, this is what it represents. And when you can see your image, when the Father, your God, your Lord can see his image in you, because is that not what God's doing? You're in a trial, and you're, you know, just, God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this to me? Listen, the answer is in Romans 8, 29, not 28. <laughs> 829, what does 829 say? It says that his purpose, because he will work all things together for the good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. See, 29 says what his purpose is. His purpose is to refine you 
and conform you into the image of Jesus Christ. That's why you're going through that trial. He's purifying you. Listen, if the truth be known, you've got some gook in you, and it needs to come out, and he's going to burn it out of your life. You know what I'm thinking? I've been walking with Jesus Christ for 29 years uh, this year, and I'm learning the hard way, and I have scars to prove it. Get it over with. Get it over with. Just let him have his way. Quit fighting him. You're in a trial. God, just do it. Get it all out. I don't want to have to go through this again. <laughs> you know, my, my son, bless his heart, we had to go into the toe doctor, and he had to have this procedure done, and, you know, he was really kind of nervous about it, and I, I said, you know, Elias, please, you know, we were praying. I said, please don't worry about it. It's going to be okay, but when they give him the shot to numb it, you know, and I'm trying to be strong, you know, I'm, you know, I'm over here. Oh, I'm turning all white, you know, which for me isn't easy to do, and I'm thinking, oh, this is horrible. This is awful, but I'm not letting him know that, but what I wanted to tell him was get it over with. Let's get it over with. Just the dreading of it is worse than the actual going through it, isn't it? Listen, I'm in a trial. I'm thinking, God, why you're there? Can you just take care of this other stuff too? So I don't. three months from now, I don't want to be back in this fire. Okay, can we just take care of this right now? <laughs> and then he says, you asked for it. <laughs> and then I'm halfway through going, no, okay, stop, 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 stop. Uncle, uncle, uncle. But this is how he refines us. This is how he purifies us. This is how he cleanses us. Don't fight him. Let him. 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds. Isn't that what James said, only in a different way? Consider it pure joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Are you kidding me? Consider it pure joy? Really? I don't consider it pure joy. I consider it pure torment and pure hell whenever I go through trials. Pure joy? How can I possibly, like Peter says, greatly rejoice? Or like James says, consider it joy. Well, the key word is in what comes after they say that. He says, these have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Amen. I'm saying, okay, let's do it. <laughs> Bring it on. I want to be like Christ. I want to be conformed to an, into his image. See, James says you can consider a pure joy knowing what God's doing and where God's going in the trial that you have been the recipient of. You know, I, I wish I could say it as good as others say it, but one said it something like this. I know God loves me because of the refining work he's doing in me. See, when I worry is when God leaves me alone. When the Spirit of God does not strive with man any longer. That's when I worry. See, the fact that I'm being chastised is evidence that I'm his son. See, I, in other words, I discipline my children. And because they're my children, I discipline them. I don't discipline your children. Now, there's times where maybe I... No, I'm just kidding. I, I never thought that. <laughs> but how weird and freaky would that be if you saw me, you know, in the back and your kids are running around and I went up there and I just grabbed them and I just started spanking them and disciplining them? Man, that would really freak you out, wouldn't it? You would probably have a word with me, wouldn't you? You know, Pastor, what are you doing? They're not my children. See, what's the evidence that they're my children? Well, I discipline those whom I love. God disciplines those whom he loves. And he's conforming us, he's refining us, he's cleansing us 
and he's washing us, Ephesians 5, verses 25 through 27, in the context of husbands and wives, which we, as the bride of Christ, he as our bridegroom, listen to what it says. This is another one of my uh, favorite wedding verses. Husbands, love your wives. I'm, I'm pointing at him, you know, as they're exchanging about, you love your wife. <laughs> the mother in law's over there going, preach it, pastor, preach it. <laughs> It's fun. I don't get asked to do a lot of weddings for, for some reason. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her, watch this, by the washing with the water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blame, blemish, but holy and blameless. By the way, did you know, I found this out a uh, long time ago uh, when I was washing my car one, one day and someone came up to me and said, you know that the water is actually what cleans it? The soap just loosens the dirt. The cleansing agent is the water. I never thought of that. I always thought the soap cleans, but the water is what cleans. This is how we get cleansed. Well, let's move on. Verse 25. Now, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Count up the plunder that was taken of man and beast, you and Eleazar the priest and the chief fathers of the congregation, and divide the plunder into two parts, between those who took part in the war, who went out to battle, and all the congregation. So what's happening? Well, the spoil, which was usually kept by those who went to war, in this case, is not the case. God wants it divided into two parts. Now, the reason I believe that God wants the Israelites to divide it and all of them to partake of it is because he wants all of them blessed even though some were not amongst those who actually went into battle. I think it speaks to how it is when we're the recipients of many blessings that came from those who have labored in battle for us. Have you ever felt like that sometimes you've been the recipient of something, of some blessing that was wrought in prayer by someone laboring in prayer for you, praying for you? I know that my grandfather, my dad's dad, prayed for my salvation. Uh, you know, he probably, as a kid, saw me and thought, oh, <laughs> save him, God, save him. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I would suggest even that there are some, if not many of you, who are walking with Jesus Christ today, participating in the blessing of knowing him because someone went to battle in prayer for you, praying for you. Verse 28, and levy a tribute for the Lord on the men of war who went out to battle. One of every 500 of the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, and the sheep, take it from their half and give it to Eleazar the priest as a heave offering to the Lord. And from the children of Israel's half, you shall take one of every 50 drawn from the persons, the cattle, the donkeys, and the sheep from all the livestock and give them to the Levites who keep charge of the tabernacle of the Lord. Uh, here again, one of those places where the passage reinforces the previous text. See, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And it seems that those who battled gave one five hundredth, and those who didn't gave one fiftieth. In other words, there was more for those who labored in battle and gave of the spoil in blessing the others. Verse 31, So Moses and Eleazar the priest did as the Lord commanded Moses. The booty remaining from the plunder, which the men of war had taken, was, this is interesting, watch this, 675,000 sheep. Dude, that's a lot of sheep. <laughs> no, seriously, 675, see, isn't that almost like three quarters of a million sheep? Oh, Verse 33, 72,000 cattle. 
That's 72,000 cows. Kate, the population of Kaneohe is what, about 40,000? I'm not saying that, you know, if you took, but just, I'm just trying to give us some perspective because you can, it's easy to read through those numbers and just, okay, so anybody, else, you know. And, and then this is the one that I want to draw your attention to, the first 34. 61,000 donkeys. <laughs> you know, I, I, I'm keenly aware that what I'm about to say is purely conjecture in the sense that it's not mentioned in the text, but I think it's certainly possible that in those 61,000 donkeys, there may have very well been one talking donkey. <laughs> no, I'm serious. I, one of those 61,000 donkeys can talk. <laughs> Ask Balaam. Oh, too late. He's gone. He's dead. You can't. Interesting. This is a lot. And this is going to come into play here as we conclude the chapter. Now, verse 35, and 32,000 persons in all of women who had not known a man intimately, and the half, the portion for those who had gone out to war, was in number 337,500 sheep. And the Lord's tribute of the sheep was 675. The cattle were 36,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 72. The donkeys were 30,500, of which the Lord's tribute was 61. The persons, verse 40, were 16,000, of which the Lord's tribute was 32 persons. So, verse 41, Moses gave the tribute, which was the Lord's heave offering to Eleazar the priest, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And, verse 42, from the children of Israel's half, which Moses separated from the men who fought, now the half belonging to the congregation was 337,500 sheep, 36,000 cattle, 30,500 donkeys, and 16,000 persons. And from the children of Israel's half, Moses took one of every 50, drawn from man and beast, and gave them to the Levites, who kept charge of the tabernacle of the Lord, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then, verse 48, the officers who were over thousands of the army, the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, came near to Moses, and they said to Moses, your servants have taken an account of the men of war who were under our command, and not a man of us is missing. Therefore, we have brought, verse, uh, lost my place here. Therefore, verse 50, we have brought an offering for the Lord, what every man found of ornaments of gold, armlets and bracelets and signet rings and earrings and necklaces to make atonement for ourselves before the Lord. Not a man missing. Now, 12,000 men went, 1,000 from each tribe, and 12,000 men returned. Not a single one of them died in battle. You know what I'm thinking? That's the reason that we have this detail of how much they gave to the Lord as a tribute to the Lord. See, these men were so grateful to God for not only their victory, but their very lives that they cheerfully gave this tribute. I want to close with the last verses with something that I think will really tie up beautiful bow around the whole chapter. So, verse 51, Moses and Elias are the priest, received the gold from them, all the fashioned ornaments, and all the gold of the offering that they offered to the Lord from the captains of thousands and captains of hundreds was 16,750 shekels. The men of war had taken spoil, every man for himself. And Moses and Elias, the priests, received the gold from the captains of thousands and of hundreds and brought it into the tabernacle of meeting as a memorial for the children of Israel before the Lord. This, to me, personally, is as fascinating as it is convicting. And here's why. They are so in awe of what God did that they offer this as a memorial 
before the Lord. See, they're giving to the Lord all this abundance to express their praise and thanksgiving to him for his abundance and goodness to them. Now, please, I need for you to hear what I'm about to say. Please don't miss this. Our worship of God and our service to God comes as a response to all that we've been the recipients of from God. Now, it's sad, but many a Christian will live their life giving to God, serving God, doing for God, because that's what you're supposed to do. And the giving isn't cheerful. It's not joyful. The service is not done with a heart of joy and gratitude. And in a way, they just go through the motions and that's why you hear, see, and maybe even some of you experience burnout. It's been said that if you don't do anything, you'll rust out. If you try to do everything, you'll burn out. But either way, you are out. I'll give you some time on that. I know it's deeply <laughs> profound, but I'm actually going somewhere with this because Nehemiah in the rebuilding miraculously of the wall said in 8.11 that the joy of the Lord is your strength. In other words, the joy, the gratitude, the attitude of God, I have been the recipient of so much from you. There's no way this side of heaven I could ever express to you my gratitude. And then giving takes on a whole new meaning. You don't see it as, I got to give 10%. Tithing's not New Testament. It's Old Testament law. Fine, whatever, man. Just, yeah. <laughs> if you've got an attitude of gratitude, you don't see it as giving 10%. You just can't believe that God lets you keep 90%. He's already given you so much. And what do you have that he did not give to you in the first place? Lord, I'm so grateful. I can't believe you have always provided for me. Let me give you an example from my own life personally. When my wife and I for 10 years couldn't have children, I made a vow to the Lord that if he would give me a son, I would serve him all the days of my life. And... Then, 1998, June the 2nd, my son, who's 12 now, soon to be 13, was born. I sold my business, made good on the vow, and started a Calvary Chapel in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, 1999. Um, then, after that, we, of course, had Levi, which was just over the top. I didn't think we, we could ever have more than one, and God had different plans, and he gave us yet another son. And I'll tell you, I, I could not in my wildest imagination believe that I had been the recipient of God giving so abundantly, exceedingly abundantly above and beyond anything that I could ever think or imagine. Then we move here, and uh, we have a daughter. And... She only lives to the age of four months and then dies in my wife's in my arms shortly after we had planted this church, actually. And, of course, we were devastated. And the pain was, at times, unbearable. But then God, my, my two favorite words are, but God. But God. But God spoke to my heart and said, I'm going to give you another daughter. She will not replace your daughter, Noel, but she'll heal your broken heart over Noel. And it wasn't 
long after that we had our daughter Sabia, who will be four years old on March 19th. Four going on 18, actually. She's already <laughs> asking for the car keys. <laughs> Jesus, come quickly. You know, as I sit and reflect and meditate on the goodness of God and all that he has given me, I, I cannot imagine anything but serving him all the days in my life with joy. It's a joy. I don't, I don't get tired. Now, I know sometimes some of you look at me and say, are you tired? <laughs> yeah, I, I look tired a lot, but I'm not tired of it. I'm tired in it. It's a good tired, as we say. But you know, because I've been the recipient of all of this from God, every good and perfect gift comes from God. It's my joy to honor Him. It's my joy to serve Him. It's my joy to give to Him. And it's hilarious. It is hilarious. You see, I mean, I, of course, look at myself in the mirror and I think, it's hilarious. You know, I can't believe it. God, you're so good. You're too good. This is what they're experiencing. They are so grateful. Not one of them perished. 12,000 of them came and they returned with the spoil and God blessed them and God honored them and in return, that's what they did for the Lord. You know in Ephesians, there are six chapters. The first three are all about that which God's done for us. The last three, our response to him. Okay, well, here's, here's the bottom line. Is your Christian life lived in response to what God has done for you? Because if it's not, I would suggest that that could be the reason why there's no joy in your Christian life. Serving the Lord is done as a burden. It's the burden of the Lord, man. I got to, you know. You know, God doesn't want that. I always like to tell people, if you're going to give grudgingly and, you know, rip the check out of the checkbook and sing right and sing it, keep it. And if you've already given it, we'll give it back to you. And I'm serious. See me, or if you're not comfortable seeing me, some of you, I ain't talking to you about it. <laughs> <You know? laughs> See Mike or Ray or one of these other guys, and they'll get your money back to you. God doesn't want your tithe if it's like that. God loves a cheerful giver. You're serving the Lord. See, why, why am I always the one that's got to do this? <laughs> really? Don't do it. I'll do it. I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than anything else. I, I'm honored to. I get to do it. It becomes a get to and not a got to. You know what I picture here at the end of the chapter? They've got thousands and thousands of everything. I wonder if in a way they almost were needing to hold back and how much they wanted to give. That's true joy. That's true, hilarious, and cheerful giving, and that's the kind of giving that God receives and God blesses and God honors. And it's not just in our, and by the way, we're not going to you know, receive a time. <laughs> this would be a great time to receive, wouldn't it? Yeah, <laughs> we won't do it. I know. We, we never have received. We always just have the box back there, but it is a form of worship. It's a form of worshiping the Lord and giving to the Lord a tribute to the Lord because of all that he's given and done for us. That's the heart here, and that's the why behind the what here. Would to God that we would be amongst those who deem it an unspeakable privilege to be in the service of God and furthering his kingdom, our master, our king, See, when I am standing before the Lord, I want him to say to me, 
Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter in. I long to, I can't wait to hear those words. You know, if God never did another thing for me, I'm good. He's already done so much for me. I mean, if he never did anything but save me for all eternity, <laughs> what should be my response to him? Why don't you all stand? Lord, thank you. We love you. And truly, we can't even begin to thank you enough. Really, our only <clears throat> consolation is that we'll have all eternity to worship you, to praise you, to thank you, and to know you. Lord, you are so good. Thank you. In Jesus' name.